even in his own cabinet. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it seems to be a very long rope, a chain of, um, they have this um, organized <laughs> crime chain. Mm. You know, the, the, let, let's even go with the, the first um, story, which is uh, the five teachers who are adopted with unspecified number of um, um, students. You know, it's, it's very sad that this is happening. That is the school. <coughs> it's happening at this period. The whole Northwest is in shambles, you know. As we speak, students going to school are not safe. And I know that there was a time that either the World Bank or the UN, the World uh, Bank actually like gave money for Safe School Initiative. Mm. So that money, where is that money going to? Have they distributed the money and we do not know where the money, or they, they, distributed, they distributed the money and the money did not get to the right source? I think that is where we begin to ask those questions. Because we cannot send our children to school and then they are being adopted by some ragtag um, um, people, bandits. you know, bandits who, who to me, until today, I see them as very heartless. Look at the 136 people that, they, um, that were kidnapped some, some weeks back. Till date, we've not heard anything from them. But rather, what we heard that the, the, the children are sick yeah. and they are still demanding 150 million. From where? Where do they want uh, uh, just the, look at the, the family, the parents? Look at the environment. You know, the children will be sick. They, of course, there's no way because to shelter them. If, they, they even even if you you walk under the sun, and you are if you are a child and you walk under the sun for for long, and you are a child, you walk under the rain for long. Especially in the north, that the and weather is always, is always harsh. Is to the extreme. Is that if it's very cold or it's going to be very hot? The children now are. Most of them are sick. Not sheltered. No. Not under any shelter. Ayo, we are talking about bandits who are not living like human beings. It is only when somebody is living, you know that the person is sheltered, that is when you know that, okay, fine. They will have a little bit of comfort. But we are talking about thick forests. And these children are there. We don't even know what they are feeding them with. Honestly. You know? And these guys, are, they've been demanding for money. Where do you want the government to get money? The, even the Niger State gov Governor, at several times, at several fora, said that he had tried as much as possible to see how bandits would be dealt with in his state. There was a time he said he even ordered that took drones for him, at least to employ technology into you know, this um, whole insecurity in the state. They didn't give him the opportunity for him to use the drones. Now, these bandits, what they want to do is to try and cripple the states and make sure that he doles out money. Now, from what I heard from Niger State, the governor says that he doesn't trust people that are around. Mm -hmm. Now, that trust is the major thing that he said there. Not that people around him, he can't the work with them. Politicians in his government yes, are you know, aiding and abusing criminals. What he's saying is that there are some people that, okay, fine, we want to give these bandits ransom. Who do we even trust will take that money to those people? That is the major thing. Very lucrative because... Because, yes, because <laughs> do you want to say, okay, and so, so person yes, come? Yes, I remember one they, instance. It would be very the, difficult. In Zafara State, that they claim they gave the bandits 800 million money, there, And then and somebody the edited the money yes, again. So the bandits are saying, you no, we so got only 150. That is the major problem the Niger State government is having. So who does he trust to, okay, fine, we have the money, who are we going to give the money? Are those bandits who are claiming 150, are they the original bandits holding on to these children? Such a Nobody knows. So that is, where, that is the, 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 the place where the governor is at this time. It's a, it's a very big problem right now. Hmm. Paul, now we have a situation whereby um, 50 students again to a region that is educationally disadvantaged, and over time, they've been trying to encourage um, parents to allow their works to go to school. Now, this is what we have. This will pose like a big setback. Yeah, the bandits know where to hit Nigeria. They know uh, the, the parts of modern Nigeria's body to hit, and that is going after schools. Going after schools. Schools are easy targets. Schools are soft targets. 
and uh, you know uh, um, it's very difficult now. I mean, there's no. It's not encouraging, you know, to uh, actually, you know, to even send children to school. You know, many parents will not be encouraged to send their children to school because schools are now uh, schools are very vulnerable. Now, up to this moment, we still don't have uh, a strategy to protect our schools. You know, we've said it 1,001 times. I'm going to say it another 1,001 times, and yet another 1,001 times, that you cannot be doing the same thing the same way and expect a different result. Mm -hmm. uh, NSCDC was given a mandate, I remember, and I've said it before, was given a mandate to come up with a strategy on how to protect the schools. All NSCDC has told us is that 62,000 schools in Nigeria are vulnerable to attacks. So what we keep having is analysis from government and government agencies who are supposed to profess solutions or execute solutions. So they sit down like us and analyze. Now, you call these bandits ragtag. But I must tell you that the weapons they carry are sophisticated. Ragtag, you call them, but the weapons are sophisticated. They have been trained on how to handle uh, these weapons. Now, look at what happened in Kebi. A policeman, just one policeman, tried to challenge uh, motorcycle riding uh, <coughs> bandits who came with what? Who came with sophisticated weapons. And of course, his fate was sealed. So we, we need to find a way to, 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 to fix this issue. Now, we are talking about, um, thank God they are doing constitutional amendments, OK? I feel the issue of state police should, should, should just take uh, priority. The United States governor was saying that, um, he also said they were, they were equipping, um, is it a, what, what's it called now? Vigilantes. Yes, special vigilantes. Vigilantes, what can they do? Can they confront bandits? Maybe they'll be they will, they will help in the area of intelligence. No, I think the, the special gathering the and all of that. The, yeah, they, they will operate in the city. Some of them mm, use, yes. uh, they use the uh, local. Uh, you can't confront. Mm -hmm. You can't confront AK-47 with gang guns. And then is that the, uh, with in, local, local they the, uh, the local jazz. That they oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> local jazz. Local jazz is very limited. But let me let me also say something. There, I think there is something that I I, I must not uh, miss talking about here. What the governor said, let us, not, let us not miss it. What the governor of Niger State said, he said it, and he was very clear about it. He said there were people in his government mm. who were aiding and abetting the bandits by providing information to them. And I, I don't want to believe that the governor just woke up and said saying what he didn't know. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. He, he had information. Mm -mm. Again, Babajide, Babajide joins us from Abuja now. Now, Governor Abubakar Sali Bello. He said the continued detention of the kids uh, in captives, and he revealed that some politicians in his government are aiding and abetting criminals engaged in kidnapping and banditry by providing information to them. Now, this is coming from the governor, and uh, you know he's, he has access to the security report and everything. What do you make of this situation? It's getting complicated, so these bandits are not acting alone. Certainly, they are not acting alone. They've never acted alone. Uh, when our friend um, Sule Yao Sule talked about the fact that people were buying houses Businesses. in Kano and insisting on paying cash, hmm. you could deduce clearly from that that these were. Um, the same people behind these bandits. Because the bandits you see dressed in tattered clothes and all that, they are working for individuals. It's such a shame that our intelligence gathering system is so suspect, is so weak that we are unable to unravel the mm. big masquerades mm -hmm. behind these bandits. And until we are able to unravel the big man masquerades behind um, these bandits, we will not get far. We will not um, uh, be able to put an end to this nonsense. 
beyond that, I think also that our strategy, our military strategy, has to be top notch because I still believe that military action is the best way to put an end to the nonsense that we are seeing across our nation. If we do not exterminate these people, they will continue to recruit people. Their numbers will grow. As, as we know now in Zamfara, there are far more bandits than security forces. Mm -hmm. So how do you defeat them when our armed forces in Zamfara state are inferior in number to the, to, to, to the bandits? How do you take them on? The governor has said that there are up to 1,000 bandits in the state. Mm -hmm. He will never even be able to have a quarter of that. Hmm. So how does he now, how does he uh, confront the bandits? So if we have this kind of situation, the, 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 the best thing is to try and defeat these guys militarily. Reading reports today about what happened in Yauri, I'm particularly disappointed because I have spoken about the fact that Yauri area in Kebi State, Mm. Given that it is located not far away from regional local government in Niger State, banditry will be common. So we have a situation in which the bandits have moved now from Niger State, from uh, regional local government, which is less than 50 kilometers to, to uh, Kebi State. Kebi They've State. moved into Kebi from uh, regional local government in Niger State, and then they are now putting uh, our people under all kinds of misery. It's unfortunate that a unity school, mm -hmm. where you have children from across our country, yes. has now come under attack uh, by bandits. So we've got to take this uh, problem more seriously. Every time people read about bandits, uh, 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 I mean, overrunning security provided in schools and taking away children. It's a massive shame on our country. It has to stop. How do we encourage people to go to school when even the few of them who are going to school, they are not safe? They've taken away teachers, they've taken away. This is a mean school. This is a mean school. They've taken away uh, the, the, the students and their teachers. They even had the effrontery to, to steal a police vehicle. They dropped three of their own uh, motorbikes mm -hmm. and took two vehicles with them. They tried to steal a civilian bus. In that picture, you see a civilian bus. Mm -hmm. They wanted to steal the civilian bus, but the civilian bus, the engine didn't start. Mm -hmm. If the engine had cooperated with them, they mm -hmm. would have loaded the student into the civilian bus. And but they, they took away the students on motorbikes because up to 200 of them came to the school. Oh. We've got to get more serious about uh, this issue. It's really perplexing. Hmm. And I feel very, very sad because there were alarms that I raised that the security forces didn't uh, do something about. Despite 1.3 trillion naira investment by the federal government in that sector in three years, Nigerians are still living in darkness. According to a World Bank report, with more than 1.3 trillion naira borrowed to finance generation companies and gas suppliers to boost the electricity supply, Nigeria has only been able to transmit an average of 4,000 megawatts for the population of 200 million people. We are still far from, uh, you know, the mark. GKB. Well, it's unfortunate that we are <coughs> where we are right now. Because if you remember, one of the selling points of this administration was the fact that it took them about six months to put into place structures. But you and I know that a infrastructure decay that has occurred in that particular sector, where the latest element was about 40 years ago, cannot be repaired overnight. And that's why putting all this money into transmission and infrastructure. It is unfortunate that we are still where we are, and that, that to me is inexcusable. Hmm. Baba Jide, we uh, the war, according to the World Bank reports, in spite of uh, 1.3 trillion naira borrowed to finance the generation companies and gas suppliers to boost electricity supply, 
we are still doing below 4,000 megawatts for a population of 200 million people. From the beginning, we didn't seem to get it right. I figured that if we had I mean, companies like General Electric, some of the biggest power uh, companies in the world, getting involved with this process, we would not have had to kind of provide some sort of feeding bottle um, for the companies that we sold our power infrastructure to. But that is what is happening at this stage. We are still these companies. You sell uh, power infrastructure, but you are still pro providing money to reflate those companies, to enable them to be in uh, good health, to provide the services for which you've already uh, considered the uh, um, power infrastructure to them. So this is, uh, this is worries of man. The question is, how much longer can we do this? <laughs> this is, this is, this is the, the big question. <laughs> Because naturally, once the transaction is over and you've um, turned those uh, power infrastructure uh, over to, to these companies, you are not supposed to be giving them bailouts as, uh, as you are giving them. We've given them bailouts repeatedly. Now, the, the, the sobering story is that the federal government has even had to take loans to give to these companies so that they can provide service. I've never had anything like this. If you are sub subsidizing electricity, yes, we will know that you are doing that uh, um, in the interest of the uh, ordinary Nigerian. But to continue to provide funds for Generating companies for discos, I do not see any any sense in it. These disco companies, these companies that um, are in charge of power supply, can still not guarantee us. Well, because when the bank was about to be privatized, it was brought to the attention that we do not have the infrastructure to hand over this thing to people without experience. Most of these discos were formed by wits. Before they were handed over, before things were handed over to them. I don't forget there was a time we were paying what they call the surcharge of a thousand naira, whether you consume light or not. And uh, we did all this program one time that we said that if every household in Nigeria is paying that one thousand naira per month as surcharge, the discos will be making a whopping 1.3 trillion every month for doing absolutely nothing. That's why some of us were happy. When this government came in, and one of the first things that the former minister for power, Raji Fajala, did was to cancel that, that scam. These people, these companies had no pedigree when it comes to power generation, power distribution, or even ordinary power retention. They were formed basically to take assets from the Nigerian people. And the contract itself, as I'm sure you know, stated that any loan taken by this this course is guaranteed by the federal government. That means it doesn't matter what they do with the money, those that they are owing money will simply hold the federal government accountable. It's a bone in our neck, yeah. basically, because we are paying these people to do absolutely nothing. All they promised, all the infrastructural improvements, the promise that they bought it, have not been met. We've been doing this for almost 10 years now. And things are getting from bad to worse. And they still get bailout from them. Not only they get bailout, they even blackmail the government to allow them to increase tariff. Anytime they say they will increase tariff, they will increase it. Ola Wale from Ikorodu. Thank you for joining us, Wale. Okay, good afternoon. Good afternoon. You? Yes. Uh, my brother, good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Okay. One of the greatest disservices that the Jonathan administration did to this country is this our privatization to this discourse 
some tools that is a cause there. Renewable, but irrevocable. So who are the people responsible for drafting the agreement and for signing it? Sincerely speaking, except we take drastic action against those people who are involved in the processes of this thing. Nigeria will continue to be in the doldrum. We will continue to be in darkness. No, so it is quite unfortunate that something like this should be happening in the 21st century in a country where we have educated, enlightened people. But we are told from uh, Bukateria uh, that all these things were given to the power that be in government at that time. That's why you can't do anything. And that is why they did, they drafted those uh, uh, agreements like that. But God will save us one day. We cannot continue to listen, to subsidize them. If it warrants, you are giving them, for the purpose of cancelling the contract, giving them the whole uh, budget of Nigeria for one year. I bet. Okay, thank you. But, you know, how do we get out of this problem by... This investment, the federal government is not too buoyant now financially, yet we need to sustain the investment in that sector. As, uh, the generating companies, as well as the um, distribution companies, must be encouraged to find the funds to plug back into the business. We can continue to provide the funds for them uh, to expand the business, to provide service. For example, I had always felt that from the beginning, the distribution companies should have been mandated to provide meters for their consumers. But that has never been the case. So your capacity to fund the business, to, uh, to put more money in the investment, to expand the scope of the business, it should have been one of the conditions to be met before um, selling this uh, uh, power infrastructure to, to these companies. But we have not done that, and we are, we are, we are, we are regretting it at this stage. And we simply can't walk out of this business, uh, this uh, transaction without paying a heavy price. Mm. It's already um, uh, well known that if we were to mm. opt out of this transaction, we will pay a hefty penal fee. And no one wants to pay that kind of uh, hefty penal fee. So government is continuing to to um, reflect the sector by providing the needed uh, financial support to, to these companies in the hope that we'll get by. But I'm not convinced that uh, this is sustainable on, uh, on a long-term basis. We've got to find a solution. Let each of those Jenkos, I think that the Jenkos have even done were to a large extent. The discos have a lot more to do by way of investing uh, fresh funds, by putting fresh funds in the business. This is what we have to encourage. Wherever they are going to find money, they've got to be encouraged to look for money to, to keep the, the business going. The federal government cannot continue to, uh, to bring the funds um, that these this, uh, this, uh, companies need to expand the scope of their, their business and uh, to continue to provide the service to the Nigerian people. Thank you for staying with us. Whenever the story of democratic struggle in Nigeria is written, one organization that will always get a mention is the National Democratic Coalition, NADECO. So when such group raised concern over governance, it should be a wake-up call. Nadeko has written an open letter to President Muhammadu Buhari over rising insecurity in the country. The solution, according to the letter signed by the General Secretary Ayo Padukun, is returned to the 1960-1963 constitution 
The group also called for the suspension of the 2023 election until the country gets a new constitution. Dr. Let me start from you. How realistic is this that um, a new constitution before 2023, from my countdown, is less than two years to that 2023 election? From our next timetable, the election that we bring in the president is going to hold sometime in February. And looking February next, uh, looking at what uh, February 2023, looking at what the Dem National Democratic um, Coalition are calling for now, and they're telling us to visit the 1960 and the 1963 uh, Constitution. How will you regard this letter from Nadeko, a mere willing of genuine call for the to solve Nigeria's political problems? Well, um, in my estimation, there's um, not, you, you can't discountenance any call at this point in the country's life where you have virtually everything going wrong. Not even Nadeko, which has contributed in no small measure to the present democratic dispensation that we are enjoying. So, but like you asked, the big question is, is this genuine? It is, if you ask me. The people of Nigeria, so to say, not our representatives now, have made their concerns known about the constitution we are running now. And this has been raging for a while. But the answer we've always gotten, and which, as at um, two days ago, still came up, has been that, see, we have representatives in the National Assembly who should be speaking on behalf of the people. Of the people. Mm. And in that constitution that we want the government to abrogate and bring up a new one, our clause is there that says all these amendments can only be done by the National Assembly. So which then takes us back to the issue that we Nigerians have been raising. Are these people truly our representatives? We committed to them. Would, well, that, 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 is, that, is, that is what we assumed happened or what we see happen. The, but an election did our votes Speak for us Except at that they time. Come out to vote. No, in the real sense of it, because they are still the ones who are, who are occupying the, those seats there in the National Assembly. They are they remain a representative. But do they really represent us? That question comes to the fore when you look at it, based on what we always say. A man says, "I'm representing you." He goes into the assembly. The next time you see him is towards the next election, which is four years. Mm. What has he taken from his constituents? What has he taken away? If you have a constituent as strong as Nadeko, for instance, in the Southwest, saying we need to abrogate the present constitution, and the only vibe we are getting from those who are representing us in that assembly from the Southwest is that nothing can be done other than mere amendments then it should tell you that there is, there is a disconnect between our representatives and the people. So we need to now sit down and ask ourselves, if we're having so much wahala, so much problems in the country, and the people are saying, see, there is a fundamental flaw, or there are flaws in the constitution we are using now, can we take another, another look? Why are the representatives of the people not thinking along that line? Rekule Yusuf, how visible is it for Nigeria to jettison the 1999 constitution for the 1963 Republican constitution? Who are those that are going to make this move? And the, we've always seen it and we've said it that the power to think panabits the constitution, not um, uh, uh, wholesale 
amendment of the constitution or discarding the 1999 constitution to go and adopt the 1963 constitution. There's a process going on now at the National Assembly, the body that has been given the power. So how do we go about this before 2023 to leave 1999 constitution to adopt the 1963 constitution? Do you think this is realistic? I don't think it is realistic. I have to be honest. Because Nigeria is a, con a country of contradictions. Mm. As we speak now, the greatest challenge to Nigeria is how to reinvent its concept of nationhood. Without mm. doing that, we will never have peace. We will never have development. We will never have anything that democracy ordinarily should give us. It is not new. Don't tell anybody. Don't let anybody tell you the National Assembly you know, is doing a constitutional review. Is doing public hearing. They've done it several times. Mm. See, waste of time, waste of national resources, just to keep some people busy. Is it this National Assembly? Please, let not. I don't want to discuss that. When you look at what is going on in our country. We need sincerity of purpose. Believe me, we always say, okay, let's do restructuring. Let's do this. Let's do that. Some people will tell you they don't understand what restructuring means. Mm. Many people who understand restru what restructuring means will tell you something else. You understand my point? Mm. So all of us, we are not sincere. For me, I've stopped blaming the president, the president, the president. We know we always say the president because each time people throw it to the president that there should be restructuring, you see response from the presidency. It, it's, it's, un, it's unnecessary. The pres, if the president, as powerful as the president is, he cannot unilaterally give Nigeria restructuring. Mm. You understand my point? Mm. Those in the National Assembly, how many of them are discussing restructuring? Apart from ordinary folks out there, how many members, including those who became somebody politi you know, politically, I wonder, what the, that the only thing they knew how to do then was to fight with one structure and they loved the structure. One thing, I've, they, one thing I've noticed about this restructuring clamor, okay. it's very, very popular in the south. Uh -huh. When you go to the north, <laughs> There's a misconception. They, that, we don't that, have an agreement that yet is, that is, on the meaning that, of restructuring. That is when people say 1960s constitution and 1962. Those are the two constitutions that were negotiated by the Nigerian people mm -hmm. from 1960, 1966 to date. They were military abracadabra. You got the mm -hmm. one you are talking about, 1999 constitution. Mm -hmm. By now, even of us did not see ordinarily on time. People should have revolted that this mm. is not the constitution of Nigeria. It was a constitution done by some people in the, maybe their bedroom or anywhere. <laughs> no, did, we no, didn't know. And the signed, voted, uh, so they, and they, that was not the constitution. 1999 constitution, but we all maybe it just willingly. But when you look at it, what is in the 1993, I mean 1960 and 1960, you will see that the distribution and control of resources. Hmm. You understand me? It truly defined Nigeria as a federalism, that hmm. a federal republic. Nigeria hmm. is not a federal republic as we speak. It's a hmm. unitary republic. Hmm. They just target a wrong name. What hmm. we are practicing in Nigeria is a unitary system, system of government. government. So when you look at uh, devolution of power, that time you will see when the Western region, you will see the constitution of the Western region, you will see the constitution of the Eastern Region. You will see the North. You will see police, Western Region, police, Eastern. You will see all that. You, you get what I'm saying? Okay. Then you will see that when we talk about restructuring, for people who don't understand, we are talking about resource control. As at that time, whatever resources you find in your domain belongs to you. Then 50% of it you take, 50% to the federal government. Then the 50% to the federal government. You know, we now go into the pool that will be shared again. The process of changing guard at the Nigerian army hierarchy is now complete, and the new helmsman can concentrate on the task. The Senate has confirmed the appointment of Major General Farouk Yahya as the chief of army staff. Yes. 
the Red Chamber took the decision following consideration of the reports of its Joint Committee on Defense and Army, led by Senators Ali Wamako and Ali Ndume, is now tasked with filling the shoes of late General Ibrahim Atahiru, who died in a plane crash in Kaduna. Tony, Major General Farouk Yaya is coming at a time that the country is having faced with serious security challenges across the board. Mm -hmm. And um, as the Chief of Army Staff, he has his um, job cut out for him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he must um, not, um, he must not perform in any way below standard. Yes, I think that was the main reason the President appointed him. And um, letting his seniors um, exit the force. You know, I think he spotted something in him. He's been, in, he's been at the theater of war for a while now, so um, it's not coming from... He was the from, field commander of uh, Operation Nadi Kai. So he's been on ground for a while, so in, I, I want to believe he knows his onion. And um, considering the fact that he's coming at a time, Nigeria is facing a challenging time with insecurity you know, banditry, kidnapping, and all that. It's been confirmed, you know, and we congratulate him for it. I think he should hit the ground running immediately. No time to waste at all. We want a change in strategy, you know, because all parts of Nigeria at the moment is being ravaged by all manner of criminal activities. So he's coming... Um, there's a lot of expectation from Nigerians, and nobody's going to take anything less from him. Mm. If, you, if you watch how he emerged, the number of senior officers that had to go, in other words, the president believes in them. The commander-in-chief believes he can do it. So he has no reason whatsoever not to act. Mm. Nigerians need a change. So it's not about putting 200,000 200, police personnel in a school. It's about equipping them and training them on the current trends. It's a new attack entirely, mm. you know, mm. and because it could happen anytime. Wally, now, looking at the Chief of Army Staff, this mm. new Chief of Army Staff, cost 35, and we expect seven. that... Uh, hmm? 37. 37, sorry. Make your pardon. Cost 37, we expect that we'll be bringing something new to the table, mm. and... Um, Nigerians clamored for the change of service chief before the late Atahiru. Mm. Unfortunately, General Atahiru wasn't able to settle down in office before he mm. had that plane crash and died. Yeah. Now we have General Farouk Yahya. I think he's coming in at a very difficult moment for the country. He has a huge task ahead of him. But when you look at his uh, background, uh, he has age on his side. He's uh, 55 years old, mm. so he's still agile. He was born in 1966. Five years ago. Yeah. And uh, he's from Sokoto State, so he should have, he grew up in that environment, you know, where we have all this kind of conflict going on. Then he's an infantry officer, mm. which I think is an advantage. And he was a theater commander of uh, Hadin Kai, you know, that was against insurgency and counter-insurgency. Yes, formerly Lafayette Dole. Yes, in uh, the Northeast. He was also former GOC, 1st Division. Mm. And he was... 1st uh, Division in Kaduna. Yeah. He was also former Chief of Staff, Headquarter, at the Joint Task Force in the Northeast. So if you look at his career, he attended the NDA, regular course. And he also attended uh, Stanford University. So if you look at his... Uh, he has a growing career, which I think... Uh, makes him a uh, better position to handle this kind of job. Um, we are also glad that there was no politics in terms of the confirmation by the Senate. It shows there is a kind of harmony compared with what we used to have in the past. No, and between I think the presidency, it's even a new trend. Yeah, for the, the very National Assembly yeah, to, to be screening service chiefs. Yes, it's that's a very the fallout of uh, first Oscar Amos yes, case. Yes, so I, th I think it's a very good thing. At least they were able to confirm. So he has a kind of uh, a legitimate uh, platform, you know, to more democratic platform that is representing us. But I think he cannot do the job alone. 
You know, it needs, like uh, you know, Tony said, uh, equipment, and uh, most importantly, intelligence. You know, uh, part of the problems we have is that most of these terrorists carry out these uh, activities. Then we react. So we are most of the time we are defensive. Yeah, defensive. You know, we need to be offensive. The we need to. Into the beauty is to prevent these uh, actions from taking place in the first place. Yeah. At least at the planning stage, when they are organizing, they are you are able to get the information and tackle you know them at the at the at the boarding stage. It's a big challenge for him, but I think with the right support from the troop, uh, we hope to see um, a lot of achievements in the few years ahead. The humanitarian crisis in the Northeast continues to overwhelm authorities concerned. Borno State harbors the largest internally displaced persons IDP camp in the region due to devastating insurgency. But the governor, Professor Babagana Zulum, insists on sending the displaced persons back to their communities so that they can farm and help tackle rising food insecurity in the state. Governor Zulum says the state is now experiencing food insecurity, that there's no need to wait for things to get perfect before people return to their farm. Hence, the need to be resilient against Boko Haram attacks. Syria. If you are in that situation now, Bono is known for agriculture. They are known for fish, known for fishing, mm -hmm. and right now what they are facing is rising risk of food insecurity because the Baga town, the fishing mm -hmm. town, it has been you know occupied by this um, terrorists for a long time. So that will stop uh, so income activity mm -hmm. and people that will go to the farms easily now. After nine years, since 2009 till now, uh, most of these people, they've left their villages, they've left their farmlands, and it's not safe to do business or to do any um, agriculture in that area. But the governor is concerned, saying that if we continue to sustain this IDP, that people will bring food that is no longer sustainable. Yeah. Because Bonu is also services the whole country as a whole. Uh, I, 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 can, I totally can understand with the governor's um, dilemma. You know, the fact is that Governor Zulu has proved time and again that he's not a politician, at least not a regular politician. He understands the humanitarian crisis. He can feel the challenge of the people personally. You see that he has been, he has been very vocal, very out there for them, you know, in terms of dealing with insecurity. Now, there are two pictures that come to mind. The first thing is that, you know, in the Bible, I think there's a place in in Second Kings, where some lepers saw that if they stayed where they were, mm. they were going that to die. That to death. And if they went to the camp of the Assyrians, mm. they could still be killed. Mm. But whichever way, going to the camp of the enemy could afford them some respite. So they mm. took the plunge. We know mm. what happened. The rest of it is history. Mm. Um, because they came back with so much food that the whole of Israel you know, uh, fed, fed and ate. When only a day before, Mothers were saying, kill your son for me to death. Tomorrow I kill my own for That's what goes on through him saying. Exactly. That and he said that, look, we need to prevent a total descent to a state of cannibalism. You mm. can't rule it out. If a governor is crying out, usually it is the nature of government to try to um, um, make bad things look good for as long as they can hold it. But if the governor himself is admitting and saying that there is food insecurity and that something must be done now or it will get out of hand. Those communities have been left for a long time. And the longer you leave them, the more you give the impression to the enemy that we're in fear, we can't come back. So I think somehow we we'll just have to take this hard choice. Mm. People should go back. But I think before they go back, there should be some measure of maybe equipping or training or um, orientation so that they'll be able to understand how to engage the enemy in case and because inevitably it may still happen. You see, the governor is saying that, look, we can't just, if, uh, a, a village of 40, 50,000 people and 10 people will just come because they have guns and everything and sack everybody. That the governor is even saying that, look, it's time for the people to be vigilant too and know how to cater for themselves, but they have to go back to their village. Well, <laughs> It's a serious issue, mm. and uh, I don't envy the governor, really. Mm. This is a big dilemma. When I read that aspect of people trying to defend themselves, that uh, a, a town of 10,000 people mm. 
they can't allow just 10 people to run over them. What came to my mind is, it depends on what the 10 people are carrying and what is available for the 10,000 people that are being attacked. You see, uh, the, the truth is that the 10 people on machine or carrying guns don't even have to kill up to 100 people mm -hmm. before they put the rest 9,900 people in fear. Fear kills more, even than death itself. Mm -hmm. That is the truth. So I do not know how easy it is going to be for these people to actually you know, defend themselves, armless people defending themselves against armed people, no matter how little the number of these armed people are. Having said that, I think uh, what is happening is telling us that we should revisit the issue of community policing again. Over the last, 20, uh, over the last eight years, about 23,000 people have been displaced in the Northeast. And most of these people are from Boronu, Yobe, and uh, the rest. Now, the, the, the truth is that it is also not easy for people to be out of their houses for over eight years, even running to 10 years. So definitely the governor he cannot be blamed for saying that they should come back home. But the truth is that we need, we need more than the governor telling them to come home. I think we need to do a, a we need to relook, we need to look into our policing system. Thank you for joining us. A new captain has joined the ship of the All Progressive Congress, APC, in Zamfara State, and the cabin must be cleared for him. After the defection of Governor Bilo Matarali to the APC, the chairman of the National Caretaker Committee and Governor of Jobe State, May Balabuni, announced the solution of the Executive Council of the party in the states. Buni also declared Governor Bilo Matawali the new leader of APC in the states, while further arrangements for new party structure is being awaited. Meanwhile, the state deputy governor, Madi Aliyu, and a member of the State House of Assembly, Kabiru Yahaya, are reported to have decided to remain in the opposition People's Democratic Party, PDP. It is now a case of string bedfellows in the state government. Now, if a member of the State House of Assembly, one member, and the Deputy Governor. To me, the defection of Bilo Matawale carries so much weight. If you decide to go with all the three senators, all the members of House the of House of Representatives, and remember, you, you want to go with over 90% of the House of Assembly, if just a member is staying back, I'm just giving that to them and the Deputy Governor. So, for Zamfara State, it's from bottom up, APC right now. Well, uh, Zamfara State has always been APC. You and I, of course, realize what happened uh, four years ago during the election, where the APC lost in the courts. Everything that they won at the state level. So it's only befitting that when the governor is negotiating to go to another party, he must come with the strength and the power of the state administration. That the deputy governor is staying behind, I listened to his reasons, and I agree with him when he said he was not carried along. Even simple courtesy, either in his personal official capacity, that was never told. Because sometimes, some people tend to stay on principle. Mm -hmm. A lot of people will obey the governor, of course. That whatever you are taking us, will follow you. But I thought that somebody with the stature and the pedigree Know the family that the deputy governor came from. Or at least common decency dictates that should be informed, even just two hours to the event. So I think the governor got a good deal. He, he has taken over the party in the states. They are going to they've dissolved the structure for him. It's now to to model the party in his own image. Jari Abdulaziz Abdulaziz Jari. He was a, f a former governor and he um, was in the opposition before now. And now that the government... Opposition within 
APC. Mm. It's not mm. like he jumped to PDP. Now, now that the governor has decided to cross over, effectively the governor becomes the leader of the party. Yes. <laughs> and don't you see something wrong with that kind of arrangement? <laughs> well, I, I don't think uh, there's anything so very strange about um, what yeah what happens. yeah what what has Deep happened down inside now, I, i'll get there Ayo, because um we all saw him before uh national television uh talking about unity within the party as it were you know um giving the impression that there had been some kind of stakeholder meeting all the way up to the mm. point you know that um matawali was you know, um, admitted into the party. So it would seem that all is well. But for those of us who watched very closely, you could also tell that he had certain reservations. Even while he was speaking, he kept, you know, referencing differences in the past and then the kind of value that he thinks that the new man will bring to the table and all that. So um, you, never can, you never can trust politicians. Mm. I think that the objective at the moment is to see how um, they build some kind of uh, unity within the party. And once the cake is baked, as it were, they can go back and uh, resolve their differences. I expect uh, some form of internal wrangling to, you know, to persist, because um, I, I don't think that uh, Yari, who uh, used to be the main man in, in that state, mm. will simply you know, cave in.